Good. <laughs> Needed that five minutes ago. Okay. <laughs> but okay, now you're back. You're only seven minutes late. It's a bit disappointing, but okay. I hope you get your bus at the end of this session. We start quickly with uh, Kewan Riai on the ideas for scenario hubs and regular updates before we move into much more interaction with two panels to conclude this forum. Kewan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bas. Uh, can I have my. Ah, very good. Very good. Yeah, so. Um, so I was asked to uh, talk a little bit um, about uh, possible uh, community services uh, for scenarios and how we can perhaps design uh, um, uh, a, a new generation of community scenario services that on the one hand is useful to the community, but on the other hand also reaches as many uh, users as, as, as possible. And uh, this is... Um, basically against the background that uh, the, since climate change has become uh, a much more prominent um, issue on the political agenda, uh, the interest in climate change data and the interest in scenario data has been increasing enormously. So if you think about the six assessment reports and the explorer that has been developed for it, um, there are basically 10,000s of users. And if, I, if you take the IPCC scenario explorers together, there are millions of hits every year. Uh, people who go there, who take the scenario data information and use it in different uh, contexts. And there are different, different users. The, the, the scientific community, of course, downloads information because uh, the scenarios Used as, uh, are used as inputs into, uh, into different projects, uh, but also increasingly scenario information is of course downloaded and then used in the policy process and, and, and very often scenario information is also interpreted in very specific ways. And the question is how can we improve the community services in a way uh, that uh, we provide uh, the best uh, type of uh, utility for, for the scenarios that we um, uh, that, we, that we have collected, for example, as part of the AR6 process. Now, perhaps before going to the to possible options that we have in that direction, let me uh, uh, explain a little bit the effort that we uh, took in the six assessment report in order to uh, basically collect these thousands of scenarios and make them uh, comparable. Uh, generally, a first step in uh, compiling the data is uh, to have an open portal where uh, modeling teams can provide the information, uh, can provide emission scenarios, and they provide it in a very standardized and in a standardized way with, with a variable set uh, which, is, uh, which has been developed over years in, in dozens of different projects, and, and therefore uh, we are building upon a, a cumulative effort of uh, model comparisons and scenario comparisons and can, can benefit uh, of that activity, uh, which is mainly taking place in the uh, in IMC and in the data, uh, data protocol groups of the IMC that uh, Volker Gray and uh, Kate Calvin are, uh, are leading. Then, when the scenarios are collected, there are a number of steps necessary to make them further comparable. Uh, the first step is uh, to harmonize uh, the emissions of different scenarios to a common uh, base here. Why is this necessary? Different scenarios use different inventories, and if we wouldn't do that, the, the climate information would be influenced by massively different bases. So it is a whole process of basically making the scenarios comparable to different inventory, emissions inventory information. Then, uh, not all scenarios actually provide information across all different emissions sources. And in order to be able to estimate the climate outcomes of the scenarios, you need to fill the missing information in. And there are statistical methods that are used um, and which are developed by 
uh, by, by different colleagues and which relied on in AR6. So basically, if you have a minimum set of emissions, you can uh, extrapolate the, the development of, of, of emission sources which are not provided by a specific model. And then, then you have a full set of emissions that you can run uh, to, the, to, the, to the climate emulators to calculate the climate. And then obviously the final step, which makes uh, the scenario database uh, uh, a very useful uh, resource is that uh, scenarios from very different groups, which different assumptions, are then made comparable with uh, climate emulators, which are taken from working group one, uh, to basically have a coherent and consistent reporting of the temperature changes. And this gives you, of course, then a, a, a consolidated, gives you consolidated information about emission scenarios, the different assumptions, the structural changes that they have, as well as the resulting temperature changes. And in this process, we basically rely on uh, community standards and methods that have been developed over many years. Uh, a transparent and open fra framework, uh, which is uh, ba basically published. Uh, in, um, uh, not only the scenarios are published, but also the way that the scenarios actually, um, the, whole, the whole pipeline here is, is and the code is, um, is published, and people can basically change also assumptions if they want to dig very deep, uh, deep, deeply into this, uh, into this process. And these are community endorsed uh, standardized vetting processes that we use as well as part of, of this activity. Um, then a second thing that we need to do uh, for scenarios when we want basically uh, to provide them to user community is uh, to, to, to vet them um, with respect to uh, different characteristics, uh, with respect to, the, to, to, to base year information that is, for example, there. Um, certain scenarios have, of course, a certain shelf time, and if scenarios are developed five years ago, they might deviate, for example, in the base year, or some scenarios assume extremely rapid changes, uh, which might be more stylized than, than, uh, rather than realistic. And there was a process in the sixth assessment report uh, where we basically uh, created a minimum standards uh, for uh, many different reporting variables, particularly uh, for the energy system, for, for, for different emissions, and for some of the changes, some of the rapid changes that we saw, and assessed also the near-term plausibility of the scenarios. And in addition to that, there was also a feasibility assessment of the scenarios, which took all in all a three-year process. And based on that, we have then uh, basically uh, reduce the number of scenarios roughly by 50% uh, to provide the, the high-quality data set uh, which is consistent uh, with the current information. Now, the challenge here is, of course, that um, this process uh, took place also in AR5 and to some extent in SR1.5 and is always a very elaborate process. And, um, uh, and it took uh, many years, and what we need now is actually a process which is much quicker than that. So we face the challenge that we have a very rapidly changing um, technology and policy environment, and there are many new scenarios also uh, produced in the meantime, um, and we need uh, basically to try to provide a, a, an updated scenario resource that uh, takes into account that we have these permanent changes and rapid changes in the real world in terms of uh, tech new technologies that are scaling up, but also new policies that are introduced, and, um, and uh, would like to reflect this in an up-to-date set of different scenarios. Um, there is also increasing interest in, uh, di in, in and the diversity of user needs uh, basically re um, requesting data which goes beyond the data that we have in many of the scenarios. And at the moment, uh, there is basically no mechanisms where we can bring all of that together. We have more or less a static database there, and when time moves on, the information in there uh, becomes outdated after time, uh, after certain, certain periods. Um, and in order to respond to this better, it would, at the one hand, be necessary 
uh, to provide services, for example, to the climate community, where we have regular and systematic collection of policy information and also agreed methods how we would translate policy information, which is very heterogeneous across different countries, into input assumption uh, of modeling. And, and such exercises have been conducted in the past, but normally they are connected to specific projects. They are done once, and then the, 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 if there is new funding coming or there is another uh, project at some point, there is an update of this. But um, I would argue that uh, what we need is actually to uh, create these policy databases, have a, a community effort on those uh, to collect the information and um, also develop um, automated and standardized methods to translate them as inputs uh, into the models. Um, another improvement in, um, in this process um, that uh, uh, that, uh, that we think is, is really useful is to move from uh, databases which are created for individual projects or the databases that are created for a specific assessment report to a live database where modeling teams can supply their scenarios at any point in time. And uh, so this would mean we would create a continuous process where you have upload of new scenarios, um, where in a certain period, perhaps annually, you would uh, vet the scenario data and uh, the scenarios that are submitted into the database and create each year, let's say, the newest vintage of most up-to-date IEM scenarios. That would assure that we have uh, uh, basically um, a set of high quality scenarios and this could be a release very similar to what the inventory colleagues do. The Global Carbon Project does this every year and publishes the newest inventory and adds a year. Here what we could do is we could publish every year uh, the newest vintage of the IEM scenarios, including a description of what are actually the features of the newest scenarios compared to the earlier ones. I think this is also, there's also contextual information uh, which is uh, very important here. And as a parallel process and as a, as a service for, for example, the IPCC, uh, we could use this process to identify knowledge gaps of what scenarios are missing. And of course, by doing this every year, we will be ready when the AR7 needs the information because we do only need to do incremental update of the database and we have a process in place so that we are not, not every time surprised how much, it, how much effort it, it takes to put these databases together. It's a little bit like driving with a car and being very, very surprised every year that you need winter tires. Um, and some, somehow some, this is a little bit similar to the, to the to the, to the scenario process right now. And good news here is, of course, that there are certain projects which start to think about including live databases also into their projects. And the project that I want to mention here is the Elevate project, which, for example, uh, Detlef is uh, coordinating. Yeah, so, so this, this new um, community service uh, could be one where you have a central database continuous input of scenarios, an annual vetting uh, cycle. Um, but in order to really make this a useful uh, community service, uh, what is also needed is to translate the scenarios for different user needs. And this, there could be certain uh, subgroups who basically work with the newest data and uh, make an update, for example, of the climate models so that we have the most up-to-date climate information as well. Or um, at the moment, as part of the NGSF activity with the finance community, the scenarios of the NGSF are downscaled to national level to understand uncertainties of national scenarios which are consistent with global pathways. If the methods are agreed in the community, you could provide here an automatic service that, where all the integrated assessment scenarios are downscaled to the national level. Uh, impact simulators would be another um, application, for example, together with, uh, with EasyMIP, and we have heard today uh, similar ideas, actually. Um, there are uh, sectoral extensions possible. Uh, very important, one could also link this to an um, uh, to a module that, for example, would automatically um, 
evaluate the submitted scenario in terms of their feasibility risks. So there are multiple dimensions of feasibility, and when a scenario is, is submitted, you could use the concept that has been um, presented, for example, earlier by, uh, by, by um, Elena Brutschin to, to, to assess different risks that are, in, that are uh, implied by different scenarios so that the transition might turn out actually different, uh, um, more difficult and understand the trade-offs between different feasibility dimensions. I think I'm a little bit, taking a little bit too long. Um, yeah, already four minutes over, okay. Then very quickly, <laughs> very quickly, it's my last slide. Um, I think the big question is um, not whether this would be a useful uh, utility or not. I think the big question is how could we as a community implement it? Um, and I think uh, in, order to, uh, in order that such an effort is uh, really successful, it needs to be a full community effort. Uh, the collection and the mechanics of it can be coordinated uh, with, with the modeling community, but all the different, um, all the different uh, user applications uh, require interactions with different stakeholder groups and the involvement across all three working groups and disciplines and that we have. And, and my proposal here would be to think about how we can uh, basically organize this. So uh, I, think, I think we need to stick our heads together how to do this. And also, uh, can we establish a sustainable financial basis for, uh, for this activity to move forward? Thank you. Yeah, that's what happens if I leave my jacket with red cards somewhere in this building. Um, we have time for one question. I see Paul in the back. Actually, the session is 20 minutes, Buzz. That is true. <laughs> then we would have time, had time for more questions. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Kaywen, as, as you say, like, it, I think it's unquestionable that this would be super valuable. It's figuring out how to do it. And I just think one, one thing we ought to be aware of is that uh, the CMIP and ESGF um, and related activities have solved conceptually similar problems in terms of data collection, coordination, tagging, you know, uh, openness, and a variety of things. So we ought to study those examples. and. Um, and sort of avoid repeating mistakes that were made and then solved in that, in that other context. Um, I wonder, is this something that can be taken up maybe at the IMC meeting in, in December and, and have a, uh, you know, a dedicated time for, for people to be involved and, and workshop um, how this might work? It's good. Actually, I see Carl in the middle with uh, one more hand. Let's do that one and then your answer. Thanks, yeah, just uh, one point on the, on the policy-related updating. Uh, I mean, there are also, uh, in the wider climate policy uh, uh, space, actors out there that, that look into these questions on a very regular update, um, for example, the Climate Action Tracker, uh, but also others, of course. And I mean, I wonder if there's scope to also explore those a little bit closer and kind of look, uh, like, try to increase collaboration with those that are very deeply looking into these policies and then try to kind of incorporate them in any kind of updating exercises. Yeah, so let me perhaps uh, start with, uh, with Carl's question. The, so the, the, uh, the new climate uh, policy database, I actually used as an example here. Obviously, um, uh, also the climate action tracker and other activities which try in a regular basis to uh, um, collect that information uh, would, be, would, be, would be a great addition in, 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 in this. And uh, perhaps we want to bring actually all the groups together to do something where we don't duplicate uh, different efforts and also eco more econ uh, economic in terms of how we use uh, the limited resources that we have. Um, um, but in important is also that we don't only think about climate policies in this context, but we need a policy update and also on other aspects which are very climate relevant too, so like energy policies, agricultural policies, uh, because they interact very strongly when you, when you add them in, in integrated assessment integrated assessment models. And then to the question of Paul, I think that would be a logical uh, uh, time to discuss this within the integrated assessment 
uh, um, uh, community, the IMC meeting would be, uh, would be a great time to do that. Um, but I would, I, I think this is, be, this, is, um, this is more than the IMC, right? So I think the IMC can help to provide the tools, but in order to really provide this additional utility of these uh, additional modules where you get tease out uh, contextual and other information, I think you need to engage with all the communities, so the climate community as well as the impact community. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Thank you. And then I want to invite the panel up here who has their names here, uh, led by Hendrik Carlsen to uh, summarize some of the key insights from this past three days. Good afternoon. Is this working? Yeah, it seems to be working. No. I use this one. Give it a sec. Now it works. We didn't do anything. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eric Carlson, and I got the pleasure to share this second last session on insights. And while the panel take their shares, uh, I have some very brief introductory remarks regarding insights. First, we fully realize that lots of key insights will come after you left the conference because there is, you're probably overwhelmed with, with the impressions as it is right now. At the same time, we think it's very valuable that we have this discussion all together here now when thinking are fresh in our heads. So we will actually try to use this 35 minutes or 30 minutes, I don't really know now, to more than half of the time we will try to, to spend together with the broader audience here. And we have a panel with us with uh, Claudia, Laura, Elizabeth and Bjorn that will kickstart the discussion on insights. And before leaving over to the panel, I just want to make one reflection myself. Three weeks ago, I participated in the Stockholm Plus 50 meeting. Many of you, you know the, what that is. That was a big UN-led meeting to celebrate the 50-year anniversary of the 72 conference in Stockholm, the first co conference on human environment issues at a global scale. And one theme that emerged very, very clearly on this meeting in Stockholm three weeks ago was the need for more structured long-term thinking in addressing global problems. And this was underscored also by the Secretary General. And perhaps many of you know that next year that he will commit, uh, he will have this uh, summit of the future. And I think this whole, things are moving now in the UN system. And I think that's a grand opportunity for this community to contribute also in that context. So with that, Claudio, is it okay for you to start from, some, from the left side here? Thank you. Thank you. So I was asked to summarize some key points from all those sessions that had to do with Earth systems. So I'll start with a session that actually looked at the IPCC outcome in terms of um, the desire that was expressed in 2019 of having the scenarios being uh, an effective uh, dimension of integration across the working groups. And so this was taking stock of what worked and not, and uh, most importantly, looking ahead, uh, trying to identify you know, directions uh, along which things may be done better. Um, so the, there were three dimensions that were uh, identified. Um, one has to do really with technical details and logistics and, uh, you know, things like uh, uh, maybe even the timing of the reports, how they are spaced to, um, from each other, um, guaranteeing some institutional memory so that everything that was discussed and figured out this time around is not going to be lost. Um, thinking of task forces or expert meetings that can be held in advance of the start of the assessment so that things start from a good, um, you know, um, what do you call it? A springboard. And then uh, the other dimension is a, a top-down sort of view of the problem where it was recognized that things would be facilitated if um, you know, some form of leadership would make cl made clear at the very beginning that um, this kind of uh, dimension, these scenarios are going to be useful and are going to be you know, prioritized. 
And then the bottom-up uh, dimension was one that recognizes that a lot of this can happen only if the community itself, the scientific community, starts working together. Um, and uh, for example, it was identified the need for impact modeling that happens and at a more, you know, not only, but also at a more global scale that uses uh, the scenario framework more systematically and in a standardized way so that when the assessment comes, it's going to be more easily uh, done. The second elephant was CIMIP7. Uh, we talked about what's going to be new in CIMIP7. We wanted to make sure that um, you know the community knows that it's not going to be a start from scratch, but there are going to be uh, you know things from CIMIP6 that are going to be very very useful, and we will build from those. Um, Something new is the attention for scenarios that are more policy relevant, that is a lot of overshoots, and most importantly, run with models that are in a mission-driven mode so that we can account for feedbacks and uh, the need to explore the difference between uh, policies that relies, for example, on BACs rather than DAC, and what that means for the Earth system and uh, the effects, the impacts. Um, and also the recognition that scenario MIP uh, is going to work best if it works in concert with a lot of other MIPs that can explore, you know, um, similar experiments uh, with interesting variants, and most importantly with emulators, which were the theme of another session. We recognize that emulators have come a long way. There is a lot of dynamic dynamism in the, in the field. There are now emulators also for IAMs, and um, we are ready to, I think, uh, make sure that they can contribute to the whole enterprise in a very constructive and uh, um, important way. And now I also want to mention a three other things, but much more uh, quickly. There was a, a session on earth systems and human system coupling and the recognition there that we need to include uh, human earth system feedbacks in scenario because this can change emissions and climate trajectories substantially. There was a um, section about storylines that um, offer this uh, way to do things as a complementary view of um, you know, how to talk about a scenario and uh, may also imply some uh, interesting uh, you know, uh, dimension of agency or causality that is not explicitly addressed by, scena by scenarios. And then um, a new type of session, Oceans, um, where for the first time uh, modelers from the IAM, CDR, and ecosystem and fisheries community came together, recognizing that they need to work more, better together to address this problem. Sorry for going up, uh, going over. <laughs> That's it. Thank you so much, Claudia. We move directly over to Laura. I, th I see that you're eager. Please. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I think it was uh, it was the oceans connection that was interesting because I think that also links into the biodiversity aspects um, that I've been asked to talk to. Um, so there was a really interesting range of talks um, and case studies. It went everything from landscape approaches to looking at oceans, um, fish MIPs, so not just a terrestrial um, approach, which I think was really quite refreshing, um, but also sort of made very clear the links to other sectors when you're talking about biodiversity. So the food sector in particular works such as fable, um, thinking of leverage points like dietary change um, as kind of a really important component that we need to be looking at when we're thinking about um, sort of modeling biodiversity impacts. Um, was, was clear, and this also made important links to the ongoing IPBES assessments on, um, on the nexus and transformative change, so the need for actually bringing the, the climate change modeling and biodiversity communities together to be able to provide um, sort of really useful information for these assessments. Um, Again, I think we, you know, we've touched on the point of how the SSPs, RCPs, have been used, um, and in generally, it was um, sort of middle of the road idea that we could sort of like use to to look at biodiversity impacts. Um, or maybe sustainability, but as a presentation by Mark showed, that you know even the even SSP one doesn't actually um, turn out very well for biodiversity. So there is definitely a need for us to engage a little bit more in, in thinking through what um, more more nature centered um, or nature appropriate um, scenarios could be developed. Um, so yeah, various discussions and a community of practice has actually been formed, um, led by um, He Jin, who's, who's going to try and bring that together. Um, there was a, a strong uh, emphasis on values throughout, um, so not just uh, values of nature, um, but there's 
Susanna was mentioning, you know, that wider societal values when you think about biodiversity are very important when we need to sort of um, bring these a little bit more explicitly into our work when we're thinking about futures. Um, and yeah, so this is just both within this understanding of the normative component, but also the exploratory component that we, we need to think about when we're, we're talking about biodiversity. Um, there was a, a really great reflexivity session, which wasn't directly on biodiversity, but I think it does relate, um, especially to this values component, because um, it really highlighted this um, this aspect of not just looking at, at biodiversity, but looking at diversity um, and the need to actually include diverse perspectives um, and to recognize our own biases when we're sort of um, uh, presenting particular perspectives. And I think that that was a really important um, take home. And so like on a, on a personal reflection note, um, I think that there's just been a, a reinforcement to be a bit more inclusive um, in how we're actually thinking about knowledge systems, evidence, etc. when we're actually talking about these, these really tangible processes that happen in place with sort of very different, different types of people and to recognize that there are different perspectives um, and especially to focus on, on maybe targeting more of our research to underserved peoples and underrepresented regions. I think that was an underlying aspect. And so, yeah, a call for, for us as researchers when we're thinking about these existential challenges to just try a little bit harder at, uh, at really um, bridging some of those divides. Thank you very, very much, Laura. So over to you, Elizabeth. We were in the same session very lively this morning about political elements, so I'm sure we will hear something on that, among other things, perhaps. Yes, thank you. Um, so. Brian O'Neill in 2020, at the end of, uh, of the, the previous scenarios forum, um, said initial progress on projections of governance and violent conflict should be broadened to include political institutions and integrated into the SSPs. And it was a pleasure to see the number of sessions that focused on that here. And I think um, uh, we really did have lively discussions around this element. Uh, the, most of the people who come to uh, Scenarios Forum are, are people who appreciate uh, at some level the desirability of having scenarios, uh, of having these socio-political scenarios. But one of the important questions that, uh, that did need to be asked was the desirability uh, of this from a social science perspective. Uh, sort of accepting that social science is not always fundamentally a predictive science. But broadly, uh, there are, uh, I think this community, especially the people here, appreciated the relevance and the salience of being able to participate within the scenario framework. But this starts to raise some other very fundamental questions that were touched upon. Uh, what is a political institution? What is political development? And what are the important features, especially as they relate to climate change, adaptation, mitigation, and sustainable development? Some of what we've, we spoke a lot about was about democracy, um, but perhaps not so much in its ideological form, but rather the features of government and institutions that underpin the types of conditions that relate to the effectiveness of policies, to nations, norms, and values. It also raised issues around what should be quantified, what is, qualita what is inherently qualitative, and what is more quantified. Uh, we spoke a lot about some of the measures that can be quantified, like the VDEM data set, uh, but we also needed to think a bit separately about projections for domestic and international political contexts, different political indicators that may be needed for emissions and climate policy analysis versus those that may be more salient for impact and vulnerability assessment. I think it was broadly noted, though, the need for expanded narratives to guide political development projections. Uh, many of us uh, came here with studies that we've done using the SSPs, which found that some of the scenarios may be too optimistic, they may be inconsistent with specific parts of the quantified or parts of the existing narratives. And so I think it was also the realization that these are not just words. Um, the scenarios need to be linked. They need to be consistent um, internally as well as salient externally. 
Uh, not all policy futures may be consistent with all SSPs. And so while it may be analytically tractable to talk in terms of dimensions and archetypes, the social sciences may start to play a critical role in informing which one of these are most relevant. Um, I think it was also highlighted the need to think about consistent futures that span from crises and failures to those that also articulate socioeconomic conditions that may be more consistent with sustainable development as well as global peace. We noted the difference between short-term trends and long-term futures, short-term trends that we may know more about versus uh, those that may um, uh, introduce challenges, especially shifts in nations, shifts in norms, but still the sense that there are some things that are possible, but also some things that, some short-term trends that may preclude later options. I think the other thing that was reflected was the diversity of the social science community, um, but also what social science can bring to these scenarios, a basis for articulating and elaborating some of the changes, the agency that we have, as well as our shared goals. I think we also, though, as a social science community, need to think very seriously about the debates that we're having, um, about how we talk about our methods, the limitations, and the desirability of these these efforts, including the ethical dimensions. Uh, we talk a lot in our own work about contestation, contestation around policy spaces, um, but, and this allows us to also question the different conceptualizations that may go into these scenarios. And I think echoing that we need to have all voices at the, at the table, our scenarios need to be rich and inclusive. Elmar made a bit of a quip um, at the end of our session. He said it takes two to tango, but I think the answer is that there may be many more who need to be dancing. And so one of the conclusions from the social science session was the potential of forming a community, perhaps starting with a workshop, where the social science community would start to think more systematically about emissions, vulnerability, what SPAs are possible. Um, and that it would be led from a social science perspective towards the climate modelers. Thank you for that time. Great, Elizabeth. Great. Thank you. So pressure increases and it increases and increases. Over to you, Bjorn. Yeah, thanks very much. I was asked to reflect on, in particular, three sessions that I think all have the theme of broadening, broadening our modeling tools, broadening the scope of our scenarios, and also broadening our scenario landscape, which I think are all also reflected in the O'Neill perspective that keeps coming up. Um, so broadening our modeling tools, for example, relates to inequality and poverty, which I think has been known as an important gap uh, of scenarios for quite a while. But actually now in the last couple of years, um, many of the big models um, have started to analyze this. We have quite a few studies that look at distributional effects, uh, that look at poverty projections, and there's uh, considering first model comparisons in that direction, which I think is a sign that we're really going from experimental to more, ex uh, more established. I think one gap that is still there, um, these analyses focus more on the mitigation side, much more on the mitigation side than on the impact side. Um, I think just because it's easier to do, because on the mitigation side we have the, the prices um, and we have a clearer understanding of how regressive certain effects are, which is much less clear than, uh, much less clear on the impact side. So I think in that sense, um, one of the things that would be good in the future, I think, is to really bring these distributional studies also much more in from the impact side. I think that connects also to what Francisca just said. Um, in terms of broadening the scope of our uh, scenarios that relates to uh, bringing in the sustainable development goals. Um, so again, over the last couple of years, there were lots of studies that looked at co-benefits and trade-offs of mitigation with individual SDGs. But gradually, I think we've seen a shift to really uh, trying to cover um, not just uh, SDG 13 mitigation and individual other SDGs, but the much broader SDG space. And I think the challenge here is really to how to deal with that really multidimensional, highly complex space with all the interactions 
the question of what is actually endogenous in the model, what is a scenario assumption, what is an output, and also how to communicate all that complexity to policymakers. Um, the last session um, is on broadening the scenario landscape, in particular towards post-growth scenarios. Um, and there was also a very much related session on uh, beyond GDP uh, right before, so these two economic sessions, we had great discussions. Um, so I think arguably, um, if you look at uh, some of the scenarios with very ambitious energy demand uh, reductions, very ambitious changes in the dietary composition on the material side, I think on that material side, you could argue that these are post-growth already. Um, but I think the question that we haven't answered yet in our modeling is what does that mean for the economy and whether that still fits um, into the existing scenario paradigm. So I guess uh, one of the outcomes, especially of that post-growth session, is that uh, there's maybe a gap in the SSP scenario space of scenarios uh, that actually try to aim for human development and environmental sustainability um, without attaching that to high economic growth. Um, and maybe just to conclude that, so there's an analogy that we often have at PIC, but maybe also at other places that compares scenarios uh, to maps that help policymakers to navigate decision spaces. And maybe the point, especially of that last session, is that our job as scenario creators should be to try to create a complete map. Um, then there's definitely the debate to be had about desirability and about feasibility of scenarios, and I think you definitely have these challenges for post-growth scenarios, also for many other scenarios, um, but at least the kind of map that we give to inform that debate should be complete. Thanks. Thank you all. Now I need to do something. Okay. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, and now, <laughs> I couldn't get that working. Now we open up for everyone, and your, what you say now doesn't really need to relate, especially to what those four um, eminent, insightful person has just shared with you. All sorts of insights that you have come across in your own thinking uh, of those days are welcome. And we especially welcome our younger colleagues to contribute to this discussion. So please. No insight so far, okay. <laughs> Shall I provide more insight? No, there is one insight in, in the red shirt there. Thank you so much. And for the rest of you, think about insights now. Uh, Edgar Hertwig from NTNU. I'm afraid I don't qualify as a younger colleague here, but I, I hope I can break the ice for, for you others. Um, I was struck by uh, the issue, actually, by our narrative session this morning um, on, the, on the LEDs, um, and I found that the community has a very sort of mechanistic understanding of narratives. Um, and this is a topic that where I have collaborated with social scientists on proposals that unfortunately were not funded uh, by, the, by the agencies, but at least we, we had some deep thinking. Um, and we, we decided that we needed to uh, tie in and, and have an understanding that there are grand historical narratives um, which actually describe of how a society understands itself um, and what it defines as, as normal behavior or as desired development. And I think that uh, what we are trying to do with our model runs <laughs> is to somehow influence that narrative um, and try to convince the public about the costs and benefits of, of various courses of action. So it is in some sense a, a very rationalistic uh, approach. Um, and of course, if you talk to uh, people from the humanities about narratives, uh, historians or, or, or people who work with theaters or, or literature, um, they have a completely con different conception of narratives. And, and narratives are sort of stories that we tell each other um, in order to, to define values, right? Uh, in order to share judgments, their basis for, for, for judging situations 
uh, that we try to share amongst each other. And, and so I, I'm really wondering <laughs> whether that isn't actually the starting point, uh, whether it shouldn't be the starting point for for the further development that, that we work with. And, and it's not clear to me, I'm struggling with this myself, of, of how we can actually interact uh, and uh, with the people who shape the narratives. And I'm afraid that right now we have left the shaping of the narratives to, to largely commercial forces uh, who, who, who exploit uh, what they have learned ab about human psychology and sociology. Um, and, and maybe there is also the artists who, who have always been quite important in shaping, shaping those narratives. And my colleague uh, Christian Klöckner at NTNU, uh, who is an environmental psychologist, has extensively worked with artists, actually trying to see how artists can take on uh, these messages a, a, about climate change in their own work as a communicative effort. And if you, if you look him up on, uh, on, on the BBC News website, you, you, can, you can actually find some of these exhibitions that uh, were developed together with him by, by groups of artists. And I, I think that, that uh, you know, I, I would like to see a little bit of, of this type of work here as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I was actually myself thinking about historians. So could we make a quick round here? How many in the room identify him or herself as an historian? <laughs> I see two hands, okay? Someone need to calculate the percentage later. So anyone in the panel want, wanted to comment on this? Yeah? Laura, please. Yeah, I'm happy. Uh, a really great point that, that you've raised there. And I think, again, the sort of talks to Maybe it's not just the climate and biodiversity communities, but what we have been doing with NIP is, is actually working with, um, working with artists to actually visually capture some of these imaginaries um, that we're actually discussing. And, and I think it talks again to this idea around um, diversity and inclusion, and if we can actually bring some of those, those narratives or perspectives that aren't part of the dominant discourse, they may actually offer us much more insights into some of the transformative changes that we actually do need to undertake. Uh, and I think this also pushes back, coming back to, to Casper's point uh, yesterday, on this notion of plausibility or what realistic scenarios actually are and how we can enable them. And, and, and we've been using within the FBS process um, science fiction prototyping as an example. I think a lot of the climate futures and things like that. Everyone thinks it's a bit whack, but um, you know, if you look 50 years ago, we're living the science fiction um, of, of that time at the moment. So, so maybe just yeah, getting a little bit of that cognitive shift and reaching out to communities that can help us think in different ways, I think would be a, a really useful contribution. Thank you, Laura. I think Elizabeth has something to say about this too. Yes, I, I mean, I think it, it also comes to, a, you know, uh, the idea about thinking about the underlying conceptualizations in these narratives, uh, you know, their origins, who developed them, you know, why we have them, who's benefiting from them. And so I think that, that this is something, you know, to the extent that the arts is one of the ways that helps us see these things, explore these things, I would see this as, as a, a very favorable uh, contribution because it will increase the salience and the inclusivity uh, of these scenarios. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, now insights are coming in. Please, here, two in the front. Hi, thanks. Uh, I'm Marina Andrievic from IASA. Um, I had the pleasure of participating in a session on Monday on gender equality, which was a double session, both coming from the perspective of differential vulnerability to climate change um, and gender differentials in, solu in the solution space to climate change. And we really had um, on display presentations with very diverse approaches, also showing that this is also a very dynamic and growing field. Um, and this was, we also had a great discussion and it was not only women in the room, which is great. Um, and I think, I'm not sure this, some, that the scenarios forum, the previous one was mature for something like this, but uh, so I'm very happy to see this and I hope that this of course continues in the future. Although I would like to also now share a remark by my colleague from PIC, Camille Belmar, who then 
shared with me today her insight, if I may, that apart from this gender session, dedicated gender session, this, um, this perspective did not really precipitate to, through any of the other presentation sessions. Um, correct us if we're wrong, but then I couldn't help but agree. So my hope for the next scenarios forum is that um, we both take this on board and see a lot more work in the field, but also that this is something that then um, spreads through, through our, that we take this in our research practices on board regularly. Thanks. Thank you. I think we had one more here in the front. Yes, please. I'm uh, Raya Mutarak from, from Yasa. Maybe I don't qualify as, a, as young as Marina, but I still speak up a little bit. Um, uh, I would like to thank the panelists for summarizing all the sessions, which I missed because I was following all the social science related sessions or the five sessions we have, two related to population projections and GDP, of course, uh, two on migration and then one on, on gender. So I just want to say that we also have moved forward quite a lot also on the sort of demography side, the social science side, so sort of we also trying to, to answer to the requests from the communities, right? So people are looking for the sort of the more downscale um, uh, population projection that account for both uh, geographical heterogeneity and also heterogeneity in terms of by age, sex, and also by education. So there's a lot of data intensive work that, that has been put into that and also the method. So we move forward also on, on that side. And then of course, Marina already mentioned that um, the heterogeneity things such as gender, which is probably uh, one may think that it's, it's a relatively easy information to collect, but we don't have much data on that, but I think we, we also want to, to move a lot on that. And also migration, which actually everyone wants to know what would be the impact of migration on the emissions and also on other side. So I, I just want to, to highlight that um, somehow I, I missed seeing that reflection of the social science component on, on this. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and uh, the, this uh emphasis on younger colleagues should not be taken as a strict line. <laughs> so, so now I open up for even older colleagues, so I expect 93 hands now in the air. I see at least one over there, please. Can we have... Thank you. Uh, my name is Lawrence Lanspilman from uh, the Rocky Mountain Institute. Uh, thanks for the insights of, uh, of of the panel. I think I think that's really great. Um, I have three reflections uh, coming from a slightly outsider perspective. Um, one of them is and and really very impressive. I think of the community as a whole, like the immense pressure and responsibility of solving not just climate change, but all the social issues, biodiversity issues, and all kinds of other things, and finding ways to integrate that into basically a, a small set of, um, of, of models and tools uh, that have the responsibility to basically do all of that, uh, which is, um, I think, almost overwhelming uh, from, um, fr from this slightly outsider perspective. Uh, a second one, which is a bit more on a critical note, um, is on the, basically, I think I heard some discussions, but quite limited discussions around critical assumptions within the IAMs itself. So for example, um, the functioning of, uh, of economics in these models, right? I think that's the most heard example, um, but the models don't do really well on, for example, renewables and costs. Um, on the scaling of, um, you know, uh, photovoltaics, and most likely in the future on, on things like green hydrogen. So these kind of bottom-up economic developments from, for example, from corporates, I, I've hardly heard um, comments about how corporates influence the energy transition or these kind of transitions, which is a huge part of how uh, what we basically have observed in the past couple of years, like the driving forces behind the scaling of, uh, of photovoltaics and what we now also see in, um, in green hydrogen. There's a couple of, of small companies, now big companies, that are doing these big investments. Um, so basically challenging that kind of, of, of thinking in terms of the, the, the underlying assumptions and dynamics. Um, and thirdly, which is, um, I think, an, an area of opportunity is actually using the insights from the models and the modeling community um, in a bit more of an active way, 
towards policymakers. So um, it, it's quite neutral in the way I think um, the, the results are um, shared. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential for um, like direct engagement and working with policymakers to basically use these results and work with these results and basically push them not just to the policymakers but also to corporates. Uh, so I think there's an area of opportunity there um, as well. Thank you so much. Uh, it's hard to say, but uh, we are running out of time. So I just want to ask if there is anyone in the panel that would have some last word. I see Bjorn's hand. Please, Bjorn. Yeah, I just wanted to connect to Marina's point on gender equality. I was in that session as well. And I think it's, uh, if you think about the SDGs, uh, it's a big gap in how we can currently model these things, at least in, I mean, Education and gender equality are uh, in the SSPs, gender equality only to the extent of gender equality in education, but then many of the uh, big IEMs essentially don't use this information. I think the, in the SDG session we saw a few uh, presentations um, using system dynamics models that I think are doing a bit of a better job of taking up this information, but that's also a direction that is really important, I think, to, to work much more um, with that dimension. Um, and just one, one anecdote on that, we recently wrote a policy paper for the uh, German Environmental Ministry and what they asked us to do was uh, to inform them how the implementation of the SDGs can be beneficial for uh, climate change mitigation and biodiversity. And here, uh, education and gender equality and also political institutions are really important uh, enabling factors, empowering factors, but I think we are nowhere near there yet in terms of actually being able to make quantifying statements about that with our scenarios. So that's also a direction that I would like to encourage. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bjorn. And with that, we are forced to move forward in the program. So thank you all, panelists and everyone else. Thank you so much. Thank you, Henrik. And panelists, and then I invite immediately the next panel up here, that is Ala, Roberto, Paula, Chris, and Alex. <laughs> and put Chris at the end, because she's going to start and then run away. <laughs> And so beyond the insights, um, when we leave here, we don't want to just remember only what we discussed and what the insights were. We actually would want to move forward on a whole number of issues. Um, and we have some institutions, organizations uh, with us uh, in the community that can help us with that moving forward, and they all have their own, um, you know, their own next steps where we can feed into where the main discussions can take place that we have identified that need to happen over these past few days, and um, yeah. So I want to uh, start with uh, Chris Ebay here, basically wearing two hats. Um, on the one hand, uh, my Iconics co-chair. On the other hand, also. Uh, Chair, co-chair, whatever of the uh, of the Future Earth Knowledge Network on Health. I'm probably doing this wrong, but it was close. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, and I do wear two hats. And from Iconics, we are going to move forward with all of the information that you've all shared. It's been a really, really exciting meeting, and I'm sure I speak for all of the members of the Scientific Advisory Committee on how excited we all were to have this meeting, to see the enthusiasm, the creativity, the ingenuity you brought, that when the SSPs were first put forward, I couldn't have imagined sitting here today and just even more energized about the possibilities for what we can do. And also, as long as I've got the mic and I'm co-chair of Iconics, we want to make sure we recognize Boz and all the amazing work he did. <laughs> and
and we should thank Pat and Fa and the whole team. And then I'll take a minute. I'm co-chair of the Assembly for Future Earth. Future Earth is an international collaboration that's working towards sustainable global futures. I'm reading their website because by developing a deeper understanding of complex Earth systems and human dynamics, that the collaboration works across the major Earth systems, including climate, water, land, ocean, urban, economic, energy, health, biodiversity, and governance. The assembly will be meeting at the, towards the end of September, and we'll be talking about the kinds of activities that this international collaboration will move forward on. And as you can imagine, there'll be a topic that will be on my agenda for, to bring forward because there's many people in the future Earth community that would both benefit from and we would benefit from engaging with as we move forward on developing more complex, more useful, and more usable scenarios. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Chris. Um, then I uh, would like to move to uh, the IPCC um, perspective on what can be next steps. We have here, uh, oh yeah, Ala. <laughs> I'm gonna stick to your f first name. Uh, Ala with us to represent uh, also the Working Group 3 and IPCC. Thank you very much, Bas. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about the scenarios workshop um, that the IPCC is organizing in the first quarter of 2023. Um, so this scenario workshop is proposed by the co-chairs of the three working groups. Uh, so this proposal was uh, submitted to the panel and the panel uh, have elevated what was originally expert meeting to a scenarios workshop which kind of highlights the importance of, of this topic uh, for the panel, i.e. the governments of, of the IPC, the, uh, the other panel, member of the panel of the IPCC. Um, so what I'm going to do is, essentially I'm going to go through the aims that we set out for this workshop. And uh, what, what really struck me throughout the last three days, that a lot of discussions that happen here in the forum, kind of uh, along the lines of the, the aims that we set out, uh, for this uh, workshop, which confirms that, or demonstrate that the scientific community is already thinking along the same lines. Um, so we have, we have two set of aims. We have scientific aims, and we have also process-oriented aims. Um, so the scientific aims essentially starting with taking stock how the scenarios were used in the AR6 uh, products and what are the strengths and the weaknesses for the approach adopted uh, throughout the cycle. Uh, so one of the issues that we, for instance, faced during the cycle was uh, the, uh, the time taken to propagate the scenarios and the data uh, throughout the literature, but also throughout the assessment. And uh, one of the implications, for instance, was for working group one, illustrative scenarios based on uh, socioeconomic projections that were several, that were several years ago. Uh, slightly outdated. Um, this issue was also picked up here in the forum, so, uh, and, and one of the suggestions, which I think it was in the AR7 recommendation, that to start the process uh, early in terms of scenarios collection processing uh, at the early stages of each cycle with all three working groups involved in coordinating uh, this, uh, this work. Um, so first, starting with taking stock, the second aim for uh, this uh, workshop is to identify any gaps in, in the scenarios uh, approach. Uh, and here particularly we're looking at needs of members of the panel, i.e. needs of the governments. So one of the sticking issue, at least in our approval, is the topic of equity. That came out once again throughout our own approval. Uh, so one of, uh, one of uh, that was mentioned in, in, in here in the forum as well, was raised on several occasions in the forum, especially Elmar uh, just mentioned in the previous talk uh, on, on SPAs. Uh, and one of the outcomes of this scenarios workshop could be a MIP, that the members of the pa panel have a policy questions in mind where we, uh, as a scientific community, uh, 
based on that uh, policy question, undertake a MIP exercise to address that policy question. Um, a third aim we have in mind is how to build the, uh, how to uh, look at the SSPs, RCPs framework and to adhere to, to Elmar's request, also emphasize the SPAs, which are important element of, of the framework as well, and what is the possible architecture for AR7. Uh, so many challenges or many issues were raised around the framework, either updated quantification, adaptation is not captured, as Francesca said in the previous panel, uh, the no policy, no impact baseline, as Bas mentioned earlier as well, uh, uh, and so on. And uh, yeah, so this was also mentioned here in the forum, so that left mentioned uh, four level of ambition for updating the framework, starting from the baseline into the projection, into the narrative, or even overhauling the entire framework. So this, this could be the, the IPCC workshop, could be a platform for continuing these discussions that is already on, ongoing. Uh, the fourth scientific aim for the workshop is uh, innovation of the, of, of the scenarios approach to be more inclusive for other scientific communities such as biodiversity. We know that there are a lot of environmental assessment undertaking place under the umbrella of UNEP such as the Global Environmental Outlook, IBIS and so on. Uh, uh, and uh, so this can be done in a coherent approach, uh, both scientifically but also organization, uh, from an organizational perspective. So these are the four scientific aims. Uh, the, the process aims, and I'll be quicker here, uh, is how to develop this process across all three working groups. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, we, we, we discussed here in the forum that there was a lack of literature timely available for working group two. Uh, and then, uh, so uh, one, one, of, one of the approaches could be that scenarios can be produced uh, as I think proposed by K1 in one of the session can be produced with and without impacts. Uh, there could be an impact emulators uh, for post-processing scenarios to make these scenarios more accessible by colleagues in working group uh, two. Um, the second process aim is a diversity of contribution, as Jim mentioned at some point, that the, the, more than 75% of scenarios produced in AR6 are coming from five models. So there will be a wide diverse set of participation in, in the uh, in the workshop, not only modelers but also users. Uh, and then finally, last but not least, which I think uh, the, the, the element that anchor the entire process is the scenarios database. Uh, which, uh, and then the issues we we're facing here is the lack of sustainable funding, as, as K1 mentioned uh, earlier, and then the compressed timeline. So to give you an example, in, in our working group three, uh, I remember the date vividly, which is a bit sad, <laughs> uh, that the, uh, the cutoff date for our literature was the 11th of October uh, 2021, and the final production of the report was the 30th of November 2021, i.e. Our, our authors had only a month and 20 days to produce the, to go through the entire database and produce new results. Uh, so this is something could be discussed as well uh, through the live database with annual vetting cycle that K1 mentioned. Uh, so that's all for me. I'm happy to talk about participation and, and how to participate in this workshop later on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ala. Um, then I want to move down the <laughs> down the line here. Um, Roberto Schaefer um, from Copa in Brazil, uh, but here also to represent the the IMC on what's next on their side. Okay, thank you, Bas. Well, I'm going to be speaking here on on my personal capacity, not on behalf of the IMC. But let's say, hopefully, what I'm going to say here will be endorsed by the IMC community. For those that are not aware of that, the IMC is the Integrated Modeling Consortium, Integrated Assessment Modeling Consortium, and basically uh, is a, a, a community where, let's say, integrated assessment models are developed, scenarios are developed. And so basically, uh, the idea here, let's say, in, in what sense the IMC can help the next, next step for this, uh, this community or for scenarios building? Uh, we had a lot of discussions here during these past two or three days about the important role of integrated models and scenarios in this just finished uh, IPCC AR6 cycle, in particular working group three. And chapters three and four are living proofs of the importance of scenarios and, and models. 
Uh, but as Allah said, let's say, many problems associated with that, huge database, uh, some difficulties or some delays in getting, let's say, the most updated uh, climb emulators. So it, in the end, let's say, we, we were a little bit disappointed, but not being able to produce all the knowledge that we would be able to do if we had more time. So I'm saying that because, let's say, since we are about to start a new IPCC cycle, uh, the need for new scenarios, I think the IMC can play a greater role as, as much greater than before. I can indicate, let's say, three possibilities here where the IMC can contribute. On my personal view, hopefully the, the IMC will endorse that. The first thing, let's say, and we discussed a lot about this the first day, the need to update and rethink the SSPs. I think, let's say, that the, the IMC community is very much aware of the need to update the SSPs, and I think this is something that we, we can greatly contribute uh, to this community here. The second contribution is very much in line with what K1 has said, let's say, the need for a kind of regular updates of scenarios, eventually tools, but something that has to have, let's say, a, a kind of, let's say, a process that has go in parallel to the, I, to the uh, IPCC itself. Let's say we cannot wait for working group one to produce results to pro so that working group two can produce results and then working group three begins the work and then basically we begin from zero. So the idea here is say, why not have this parallel process, as K1 has indicated, let's say, to have a continuous production of scenarios, updates, etc., so that by the time we, we enter a new cycle of the IPCC, basically we do not need to start from zero, but we can, let's say, move much, much faster with much better results. And the final suggestion here is something that a decision that has been taken at the IMC level already, which is to create a scientific group on national models. We saw, we had a discussion here, here on, on Monday about the underrepresentation of national models and even an underrepresentation, let's say, of some countries or groups in the IPCC itself. So this is something that we're in the process of, of doing that because as of today, most analysis at the, uh, at the integrated assessment level are global scenarios coming from global models. We have some, let's say, national models, mostly from, let's say, the big developing countries. So a big effort has to be made here, let's say, to bring new communities, new countries, let's say, new capacity building in order to have, let's say, a much more broader representation of the community. Not only because, let's say, when you talk about mitigation, mitigation really takes place at the national or subnational level. So I think this is also a great contribution that the IMC can provide, and we are in the, moving in that direction, let's say, to provide capacity building, but 30 seconds must. Uh, we have to, to realize that there is a reason why we have this bias towards global models and, let's say, major economies. Funding is the key issue here. Most of the projects that have been generating all the great work we do are EU-funded projects. Thank you very much for EU for that. But we have to have, let's say, a, a broader source of funding to allow, let's say, other countries, other regions to be better represented in this process. So, these are my suggestions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Then moving on to Paula Harrison from the IPES. Thanks, Bas. Um, so, uh, yeah, lots of really exciting key out outcomes. And I'm, I'm going to start with rather a one key outcome that I'm hoping everyone here has now learned how to pronounce IPES. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard it many times. You're trying, but on slightly more serious note, so I've been really encouraged here by the overwhelming interest to work across communities and across scenario frameworks. So there's been a real almost um, urgency in terms of the discussions I've heard about opening up scenario frameworks, including the climate scenario framework, so that we can enable and facilitate this collaboration across different issues. Uh, and I think in almost every session we've been in, and we did a Mentimeter and one about, is there a need to start coupling some of these frameworks together? And it was pretty universal that that need is there. That need is really clear for it best, because it's very difficult to uh, look at 
biodiversity issues and reversing biodiversity loss without also taking account of climate change, but also many of the other issues that it links to. Um, and the, particularly the ongoing assessments, the nexus assessment in particular, that's looking at the interlinkages between biodiversity, climate change, food, water and health. So we really do need those integrated studies that take that systemic, holistic approach. And to do that, we need scenario frameworks that talk to each other, that can be coupled when the purpose of the individual scenario study needs that to happen. Um, so some of the other uh, um, assessments that are coming up as well in ITBES, so that we have another ongoing assessment on transformative change. And I think this has also talked to uh, another area where I've heard it mentioned that it's been really useful to try and open up the solution space in the uh, climate scenario framework. And this talks a little bit to the presentation by Elmer earlier about um, the fact that the SBAs haven't been used that much this, uh, this so far compared to the SSPs and RCPs. Um, and they were still, I noticed, in mainly referred to as shared climate policy assumptions. And again, there is that confusion about what is an SSP and what's in an SPA. And again, I think that's where the communities can start to come together and work out, OK, it'd be really nice to have some biodiversity policy dimensions. But also, what we're working towards in the Nexus assessment is trying to find policies that don't work in silos, that work across policy sectors to provide co-benefits and synergies. So in that case, it's quite difficult to still work to think of policies in isolation. And I think we really, again, need to move to an integrated perspective. We also have, um, it best has a business and biodiversity assessment that should be starting next year. Uh, that, uh, again, that will also require some interesting integrated scenarios. We've now got the task force on nature-based financial disclosures to work alongside the one on climate. So again, another call for working together between climate and biodiversity communities. So I guess the main thing I'd like to finish on is what's the mechanism to actually make sure some of this actually happens so that we don't come together in three years' time and we're still all saying we really need to do this, it's really important, but we actually do need studies out there so that we can actually move forward in both ITBES and IPCC and inform the policy processes that those assessments are supposed to inform. Uh, and I think there's probably two levels here. I guess there's a high level between it best itself. We have a task force on scenarios and models, um, and then there's the IPCC side. And there has already started to be in that collaboration with the new workshop report on biodiversity and climate change. And I think we need to push that forwards and really highlight the importance of scenarios. And I think the other area is the more bottom up at the scenario community. So we've got the it best plenary is taking place in two weeks time they will be considering the foundations of our nature's futures framework at that. And what we're hoping that the uh, government delegations will say is that they're going to invite the scientific community to accelerate the development of scenarios and models for biodiversity and ecosystem services to use in the assessments of their platform. And that's so vital with the nexus and transformative change assessments. So that's my finishing statement is the call of action is for you to please start working on coupled uh, biodiversity and climate scenarios and to do this urgently because a cut-off date for the literature for the nexus and transformative change assessments is likely to be next autumn so please start working on these exciting scenarios so we can pull them into our assessments thank you thank you <laughs> and then last uh, Alex Rill from UN DASA on the, the role that from the more the user perspective on the role that actually scenarios could play in the UN system. Is it on? Yeah. Um, thank you, Buzz. I First of all, I would like to join Chris in what she said in the beginning, thanking everyone for this really fantastic three days of forum. I think that's the place to be, to learn about what's going on in the community and see what users like the United Nations and their member states uh, could gain uh, benefit from, from, from that. I have way more to say than I can do in three minutes, so anyone who wants to follow up with me, please, please do so. And I also can tell you a little secret. I'm a little emotional, you might hear this, because I, I used to work here as a research scholar in the 1990s, a long time ago, so some of the older ones among you might still remember me. So I'm, I'm in a way, I'm one of you, right? So I understand some of the the, the, the basics and the, the incentive structures the, within which you work and so on. 
but 22 years ago, I left EASA because I wanted to make an impact, an impact with those decision makers who, who were making the decisions. So I went to Asia to advise governments in the, in, the, in the framework of the UN, and ultimately ended up a few years ago in, in, in UN headquarters in New York to work on, on entry points for scientists and engineers. I see quite a few who have recently been more and more engaged in this, and I hope after this some of you may come back and, and, and consider some of these engagements. Um, so I have three points basically. First, on what kind of scenarios would be really useful for the context of member states' discussions and, and uh, UN global agendas that I'm uh, working on in New York. Secondly, what the entry points are. And thirdly, I would leave with you a very concrete proposal for your considerations, very much in line with what I've heard, especially in this last plenary. So what kind of scenarios? I think it's great to see SDG scenarios and the shape projects and some others are, are really taking shape, so to speak, and that there'll be a lot of information that uh, we can learn from. But the thing is, of course, that we're halfway in on the uh, SDG timeframe with most goals in 2030, right? So we had this started the discussion in 2011. By 2015, we had the SDGs, and now we're halfway in the, the time frame. So I believe we also have to look way beyond that to post-2030 already. You, I would encourage you to proactively think of some products that would be ready in time for that. Um, I will tell you a little bit in, in a minute um, what are these entry points are for that discussion. Yeah, I heard a lot in this uh, research group uh, discussions on climate and energy, water, materials, nexus, the, the, the link to biodiversity scenarios, inequality impacts, gender, wide inclusion aspects, all of which I think is very important, but they need to be made available. And we heard some suggestions here, which I would fully endorse to organize, <laughs> I think. What's, what's much more needed is the development perspective, education, health, differentiated impacts on population groups, digitalization, AI, how it's really integrated. The national level was pointed out by uh, Roberto, so you know we need all of this linked to a global benchmark, also at the national level. Um, we need a capability in the community to respond to immediate crisis, like you know the pandemic, we talk about the Ukraine war and its impact uh, through the food and energy systems, and we probably need a way to find simple models, you know, that can be used for rapid response. So what are the entry points? I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> wrap up quickly. So there are some that are mandated, they're recurring. There's a 10-member group of high-level representatives where some of you, I uh, recognize Naki, k some of you have been much engaged. I would encourage all of you in the coming years to be engaged and, and work with them. There's an annual forum that brings this together where you can have events and, and feature some of your work. We bring together 46 UN entities on this, so if you want to work across some of them, partnerships with uh, a group of them, you can uh, contact us on this. The Global Sustainable Development Report, also in our uh, team, of course, the next one will be uh, 2023. It's the last phase is now to be completed by the end of the year, but if you have something on really SDG scenarios that you want to share with us, do so now. Um, the annual SDG review that we prepare for where prospective elements much needed, but the scenario community is not much involved, including in the voluntary national reviews. The climate change negotiations in the General Assembly, which are often a test case for UNFCCC. I see the red card. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> the annual ECOSOC high level segment, I try to wrap up. Um, the Our Common Agenda 2021, which brings a wider concept, and we heard some things on the, uh, the summit on the future next year, the UN SDG summit, which would take stock. If you want anything, you have to have this in the next few months, the SG envoy on future generations, and so on and so on. I'm not gonna uh, do this. I just give you this last bit on a particular proposal. So I think we need beyond the organization and the databases and all these things that were suggested for the scenario analyst community, we need a better institutionalized interface with those decision makers in government and in the private sector. So I suggest some partnership or network or lab or whatever you want to call it on this. 
that would look at two key things. One is communication support in both directions. So a scenario analyst should get the information that they could use to be proactively working towards future demand that might arise from governments rather than you know, being reactive to it. And uh, they, they should support the communication of the scenario insights to those decision makers so they can actually be used at global and national level. And finally, it could have, because it brings these people together, the, the match demand and supply of scenario analysts at the national level. Because I think that's where the decisions are being taken and where you know, not many coherent um, ex exercises, those that exist, they're often not coherent with the global ones. And I think that's, that's really needed. We could talk about very volunteering progress on this. Anyone who's interested in this, you know, please uh, contact me or the organizers here and, and we'll follow up from there. Thank you very much. Sorry for going over time. I would have a lot more to say. Yeah. <laughs> No, thanks to, uh, to all of you. Um, I'm going to read the room a little bit and just ask for whether anyone in the room has any other urgent messages to share with the others before we start wrapping up and ask the technicians to put up my, uh, the, the last final uh, presentation as well. Julia. Thanks. Yeah, I have nothing to share, but a short question for everybody looking forward, because this was scenarios from was was originally meant to bring modeling communities together, and then there is this crowd of social scientists, and my feeling is both engage a lot. And my my question is, how many of you identify as social scientists? Could you just raise your hands? Just I have no sense of what this being in out, and so it's. It's quite a substantial number. I just wanted to get an idea. So thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks for that. Jack, I'm not sure how to interpret it yet. Let me think about that. <laughs> how to, <laughs> we need to calculate that share and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> Any other last remarks? Otherwise, I have some reflections on what's next from here. Um, oh, that's interesting. For one, you'll see a participant survey coming your direction soon, once it's finished. Um, and then we have to get this community keep going with everything that we've discussed here. We have three Iconix webinars basically lined up for you over the next months. For one, we need to digest all of this with the, steering, with the scientific steering committee from this meeting. Uh, into what can actually be proposed as next steps for the whole uh, process, and we'll discuss that in a uh, webinar at the end of the summer. And then there's also on the updates process and the communication processes that have been discussed here, there will be other webinars in October and the fall. And to keep going, um, basically we wanted to do these scenarios forums every other year, and we also wanted them to be hosted by different places every time. And so there will be coming an open call for hosting the third scenarios forum in two years from now. And so start thinking about that, whether you would want to uh, be part of this series and, um, and host one of these. Um, then there's a lot of uh, people to thank for these past three days. Uh, first of all, um, three incredible, generous sponsors. Uh, IASA themselves, the Climate Works, and the Engage Project, and our partners for, these, uh, few, uh, for this scenarios forum, the IMC, IPCC, Future Earth, WCRP, and Earth Systems Governance. Um, we have a lot of people that provided us with a lot of uh, stuff. We had good food from a very good uh, um, caterer, uh, but there's many more other things that go into this. Um, we have a great technical team that made things work, especially uh, Michi and Andreas. <laughs> We've had a great team supporting us actually here from this conference center, uh, led by Alexandra Dangel.
And across many parts of IASA, many people actually helped us out here. Uh, from you know, just running Connect in the background to processing all of your payments to people helping us out with hands the past few days. It's a very long list, so let's give these people a hand as well. Um, yeah, the contents be more or less brought by you by selection and many discussions in the scientific steering committee. Um, and before we applaud, I want to make one highlight for a person who could not be here, but made our lives a lot easier than it could have been by leaving us with a very good process after the first scenarios forum that we could build upon and recycle. And unfortunately, it's not here, but let's give a hand to the whole scientific, scientific steering committee. And then an organizing committee that's been uh, the most dedicated I've worked with. Um, let's see, there should be here Fa and Sylvia, Jason, Charlotte, Pat, and <laughs> Carmen, and many people coming. It wouldn't have been what it was without Tara. <laughs> and for this small organizing committee, there's a few more gadgets coming, but the mailmen were not working with me. And so they delivered a box of, uh, yeah, we'll see after this. <laughs> okay, with that, we're gonna send you all home and take your bus in seven minutes for to the airport. <laughs> and thank you for being here. I think you should give Bas a special hand at the end of everything. So Bas, thank you. Thank you for everything.